Let's get started here. So, for the Coke as is valuation. Um, <clears throat> now, again, you might have a slightly different share price than I do, depending on what exact time you did it, because obviously Coke is trading in real time. But I did mine when they were trading at 42.75. Okay, so again, your share price will be a little different. That's okay. So 42.75. All right. So again, filling in the data, WAC at 6.4. Um, we're going to talk about how to estimate a G here in just a minute. Okay. That's actually part of the exercise that we're going to do today. But uh, shares price, shares outstanding, uh, estimate the EEO for sales and EBITDA, put those in. Again, based on this share price, at the time, I went to the template to get the EV to sales and EV to EBIT. Again, Bloomberg is calculating those in real time. So at the time, EV to sales, 6.84, EV to EBIT, 20.4, getting me the estimated margin of 33.5. So if I go over here to ratios, a couple things. Number one, undo that. Number one, I want this number, 2022 EBITDA, to adjust to get this number to be 33.5. So I cut that to 37.8. Okay, and we need a tax rate for Coke. Now, here's the thing. We could have just done an average of the last five years. It has been bouncing around. But what would be preferable, and that's what I was mentioning in the real world, the simplest way I often get a tax rate when I'm doing a model of a company is I'll just ask the CFO or ask the treasurer. They just, they'll tell you. And so that's why I said if you go to Bloomberg, it can be helpful. Uh, if you go to Bloomberg, and you type in EVT for your company. So I'm on KO US Equity and then EVT. Let's go back to the same screen. These are all of the corporate events that are recently completed plus upcoming, including, for example, uh, the call in number for their uh, analyst calls. So, for example, <clears throat> this is going to be the call in number for the quarter one 2017 results when they release them on. April 25th, and the analyst will then get a pin to be unmuted, but nonetheless, this is the call-in number. You'll find it in Bloomberg. So what's interesting is all these things over here are, as soon as a presentation is over, Bloomberg will post the PowerPoint slides or PDF. They'll post a transcript, and typically it's machine learning, so they're kind of recording it, and then they just have an audio transcript of the call as well as a text transcript of the call. So the point is... <clears throat> Coke in its fourth quarter call and its financial modeling call, which they have, a lot of companies do, but basically in the fourth quarter conference call, I just went through the transcript and I quickly noticed, if you click on the um, press release, the transcript is available, so just click on it and then you can download it. But I quickly went through there and what the CFO said in the call is, our tax rate is going to be higher in 2017, I estimate 24%. And then in the financial modeling call, somebody else from Coke said, I think it could be even higher in 2018. It could be as high as 28%. Okay, So that's a very, very valuable piece of data because if we had just used the average tax rate in the past six years, we probably would be underestimating even what Coke thinks they're going to pay in taxes. Now, both of them put a caveat that subject to whether the new administration successfully changes U.S. tax laws. Right? But they're assuming that if it doesn't, their tax rate is going to be around 26% in 2017 and 28% in 2018, somewhere in that range. So <clears throat> here's the point. I actually put into, or sorry, take it back. She said 24%. He said 26%. That is wrong. Uh, but nonetheless, I put in the 24% tax rate uh, here for the 2018 tax rate that the CFO said as my model number. So again, was it 19 and a half? Wouldn't have been the average. It would have been a little lower than that. But I'm using the 24 number. But that's where it came from. Yeah. Um, why wouldn't you apply the 28 percent during two years out? Yeah, and again, it's I, I'm just keeping it simple. So again, I'd, I'd have to make a judgment call on what is more realistic. But what I'm going to use is I'm going to use the CFO, which he said it's going to be, and then I'm going to start with that. Okay. But, but that's the whole point. We're trying to figure out what it is. So if I really if I really believe the person who's not the CFO in the later call, then starting in two years, I can make an adjustment rate, and we have the ability to do forecast year by year. But for purposes of this, let's just say it's 24. Okay? Now, <clears throat> let's go back. Uh, 
and I'll, let me just validate that one last time. Now, I have a feature in my version of the terminal, which you may or may not, call the transcript analyzer. If you type in TA, does it allow you to go to this? <clears throat> because this is a, a feature Bloomberg charges extra for. <laughs> they don't usually give that to uh, the base license. But <clears throat> one of the things I can do is I can search by company. Do a single security. And I can type in a keyword. And it'll basically give me every use of that keyword by the company. So let me go back and just validate what I remember. My memory's fuzzy with all the sun. Uh, where is it? 24%? Yeah, this is with the CFO, Kathy Waller's Coke CFO. So she said 24 in 2017. Did a geographic mix impacts the currencies. And then... In the other conference, oh, sorry, I said 26. I'm uh, sorry, he didn't say 28. I got 2018 mix. He said it could go as high as 26. So Timothy Leverage, and I don't know who he is. So Timothy Leverage, who is their VP of Investor Relations. So CFO says 24% in 2017. VP of Investor Relations says as high as 26%, not 28%. My mistake. So, but nonetheless, this is... Again, I can search through the, the transcripts, but if you open up the recent transcripts for your company, odds are you're gonna get data like this. Now, not every company would have an investor modeling call like Coke did, but nonetheless, the, at least in particularly the latest annual report uh, you know, release, or the 10K release or 10Q release, it's gonna come up. All the analysts need to know what the tax rate is to do their models, so the company's gonna give them guidance on what they think it's going to be. So this is what I'm just saying. That the general principle of this class is right now, instead of putting in our own guesses, let's try and be as realistic as possible with the guesses, okay? Including the G, which is what we're building up to. So we got a tax rate. All right. <clears throat> now we got an EBITDA margin in the out years going down to 37.8. <clears throat> uh, so basically, I just kind of moved it down closer to 37.8. And with no sales growth, I get 24.73. So <clears throat> we know the margin, we know the tax rate, the growth is the hard part, and the G is the hard part. And what we've been doing up to this point is we've been trying to guesstimate, well, what do we think the G should be? And then therefore, what does the growth be? Well, instead of saying, do I think it's three, three and a half, four, et cetera, <clears throat> I'm gonna give us a way to estimate a G. So if we go back to our lecture notes, long time ago before spring break, we did multiples. In the book and in the lecture notes I gave you was the breakdown of the for formula in the rearranged key value drivers to do EV to EBIT. So that's the EV to EBIT formula that will estimate an EV to EBIT. So here's the deal. I want to go to our model and in the assumptions tab, I started to do this here, starting with D14, I want to estimate a G using the EV to EBIT multiple equation. Okay, so what are the components of EV to EBIT? Okay, so EV to EBIT, to do it, I need A, I don't need an estimated no plat. I need an estimated ROIC, so clear that. I need a WAC, I need to know what the EV to EBIT is estimated to be, I need to know a tax rate, and then I need to know a G, and that will get me my estimated EV to EBIT, okay? So, few things. One, ROIC. ROIC is operating ROIC in this formula, okay? So it's not the formal definition that Bloomberg uses is the operating ROIC that we've been talking about. So here's the thing. It's the forward, this is the perpetuity formula, so it's the operating ROIC going out. Well, in our tab, EPEOY, we have historical and future end of year ROICs. So we'll notice that based on the jumps in EBITDA margin, 
And what Coke is primarily doing is they're selling assets and they're focusing on more profitable businesses. And they're giving a lot of their bad assets to the bottlers in order to raise their margins and then their stock price because they're not growing because they do have a sugar problem. So the way they're helping their sugar problem in the short term is they're basically cutting costs and cutting unprofitable parts of their business. That's part of the reason why they're shrinking. They're going to give some of that stuff to the bottlers. So long story short, the ROIC for Coke is going to jump in 2016 and 17 from where it has been historically. Right. So <clears throat> that's just using the consensus estimates. And so it jumps from the high teens to the low 20s. Right. And if they keep shrinking, obviously it would get worse, but they're probably not going to shrink forever. So long story short, next couple years, somewhere in the 23 to 25 range. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the 2018, because we're using the second forward year. Oh, sorry, for the estimate ROIC, I'm going to use, I'm going to use 26% again. Back to this. EPEOY. I'm going to use the 26% in 2018 as more representative of Coke's future. All right, 25.9, I just rounded off to 26. All right, because it's one, it's the second forward year. And two, I, I think that Coke is going to get credit for getting rid of assets and improving their performance in EBITDA. I think Coke is also going to get credit for not seeing their business shrink forever. They're smart people that are going to figure this out. All right, so I don't think their ROC is going to drop because sales are going to drop. I mean, they'll figure something out. So long story short, I'm going to use 26%. I think that's a reasonable number to use. All right. Then I'm going to use the WAC of 6.4. I'm just copying the WAC that was here. All right. The EV to EBIT is the trading EV to EBIT at the time that I did their stock price earlier today. I'm just referring to that. The tax rate is the same 24% that... Uh, I put into the ratios tab here and I use the 2018 tax rate because it is the second year EV to EBIT formula. Okay. So essentially, uh, now they're carrying over here. I didn't make that 26, but if I really believe 26, I could make it could have made that 26, but nonetheless, I'm using the same 24 and <clears throat> for 2018. So that's what that cell refers to. And we're going to solve for a G. So right now G will, will start out as zero. Okay. So what I next need to do is I need to put in the formula. So I'll do this again. File, and I'll save this as the video. I need to put in this formula. Here to estimate the EV to EBIT in the model. So, equals, left parent, 1 minus the effective tax rate, okay, times left parent, 1 minus the estimated G, continuing value G, divided by the estimated ROIC, right parent. Take all of that, left parent and a right parent, and divide by... You see the formula here, WAC minus G. So WAC minus the G. So <clears throat> screw this up. Why is there a zero in there? All right, so eleven point eight eight. Right? So basically with a zero G. Coke would have, <clears throat> yeah, with a zero G, Coke would have an EV to EBIT. And for those of you who wanted to see the order of operations based on those cells. So that's really the trick, just putting it in with the correct order of operations. But with a zero G, Coke would have, and these assumptions, an enterprise value to EBIT multiple of 11.88. Well, obviously, they're trading at 20.4. So Coke is probably expected to grow. So that's the point. What we're going to do is we're going to, and, and you could do a solver, right? But in this case, we're just going to iterate until we get to a very close number to see what the trading multiple tells us the G should be. So this is really the exercise. So the exercise isn't, do I just gut feel the G, which is what we've been doing previously. I want to use some observed market data 
to help me get a more realistic G as a starting point that explains the current stock price. So again, remember the as is, it's not whether we agree with it. We're just looking at data points in the real world to get closer to the approximate cash flow valuation of the company. So as I change this, so again, hit escape. So G of 2%, G of 4%, yeah. <coughs> One minus the tax rate times one minus the G over the ROIC, all of that divided by WAC minus G. That's just the formula. Okay. All right, so I'm at 4%. Well, and at 4%, this formula plays out to 26. That's too high. So 3%. Now I'm closer. 3.3. Okay. It's not as dramatic when you kind of know what the answer is. 3.1, and now I'm closer, and then 3.12, and now I'm almost exact. So <clears throat> long story short, what we've done is we've just backed out of the trading multiple <clears throat> of EV to EBIT, the actual trading observed multiple, a reasonable guess that the G is slightly more than 3%, right? Because as I said, we would have tried to estimate this ourselves. And given Coke struggles, we might have put that number low. And I'm not saying we, we don't adjust it when we do our target valuation, but at least we have a better idea what the market is doing. So if there's four data points that we're trying to solve for. Number one is growth rate. Number two is EBITDA margin. Number three is tax rate. And number four is G. Those are the four most important variables. We got three of the four. All right. So now what we really need to do is focus on the growth. So what growth rate then gets us a 42.75 stock price, right? Now there's two ways to do this. One is, and somebody mentioned this earlier in class, if we go to the EEO for Coke and we look out here into the future, like the, there's analysts that are forecasting more than two years, all right? And just to clarify, the reason why we use two years is you'll notice that the number of analysts after year two start to drop. So 20, 20, 15, five forecasting sales. And then even the year after that, there is a forecast by two people. So it's not that we don't use those out years, and you can as a guidance, it's just they're less forecasted. And it's again, not that the analysts aren't forecasting them, it's just they don't wanna put themselves out there because your every data point you put into Bloomberg is tracked. So generally they'll upload the first couple of years and the first eight quarters, but they generally don't upload as many analysts don't upload it, the future years to Bloomberg. So there's not part of the consensus. So it's not that they don't have one, as I said, it's just they're being tracked every time they guess and nobody wants to look bad in front of their clients. So <clears throat> I just, I'm, these are less reliable, but at least they give us some data point that people don't think that Coke is gonna shrink forever. All right, and again, they're probably going to do something, whether it's, you know, buy Monster is one of the continued rumors, which to me doesn't seem like a long-term solution, because at some point I think energy drinks are worse for you than sugar. So I don't see that as the growth market, but they will do something, whether it's water, whether it's, you know, other drinks, diet drinks, they're going to figure something out. And I think that's what the market is saying. They're going to stabilize and start growing again. So if I look at these growth rates, and I can translate to growth, I can even start to use some of these. So I got 4%, 7%, and then zero. So let's put in these are after the declines. Four, seven, zero. And that gets me to a share price about 45.52 versus 42.75, which is their current share price. Okay. So what I'm saying is even though there's a couple of analysts out there that are expecting 4 and 7% growth, I don't think the market is actually expecting 4 and 7% growth <clears throat> based on the way Coke is actually being priced. Because right? again, remember the buy side are the people that are actually buying the stock. The analysts are the sell side. They're trying to convince me what it's worth. And what I'm just seeing is, if I had to imply here, some skepticism about Coke's growth rate long term. And even though this anal these couple of analysts are saying, oh yeah, they're going to return to 4 to 5% growth, I don't think the market's trading it that way today. I think the market's actually trading it with even more tepid growth in the next few years. What's ironic is I still think the market's using a G of 3% long term, 3.1%. So again, if I had to interpret what I think the market is saying 
is the market saying is the next few years are going to be a real struggle, but Coke's eventually going to figure it out. Okay, so they're they're smart people. They're an enduring company. You know, they're going to be around. All right, but they're going to struggle for the next few years. And even when you look at these forecasts, I don't think in 1920 the market is pricing them as if they're going to grow back to the as is. So I think that this number is going to be closer to one percent. <clears throat> And around 1% growth, I'm now really close <coughs> to their share price. Okay. So, again, <clears throat> that's the way the market is trading Coke, which even slightly differs than a couple of the analysts in the out years, which are probably a little bit more optimistic about Coke. Right. And, again, it's not whether I agree with this. This is just using data to back in and applying the academic models to this to say, all right, here is what that intrinsic value would have to be to equal the share price. Therefore, here are the ratios. Here's some trading information about the ratios. And now we have a baseline for our model that we can build off of in our valuations. Make sense? All right, so this is the first thing I wanted you to do today. So for the valuations that you just did for your group projects, apply this. Right, because as you did your as is, you said you didn't have trouble, which meant you came up with a G. Right, I want you to use this method to refine your G. Right, at least for your as is valuations. Right, it's a good practice. Questions about what we just did? All right, so here's the next step. This is the second modification we're going to make in class today, <clears throat> which is. Go back to Coke in Bloomberg, type in FA, and in the FA screen, you can see in the default key stats, Bloomberg's definition of enterprise value. Okay. So, when Bloomberg talks enterprise value, and this is pretty standard on Wall Street, and most companies will follow this, and to be honest with you, most textbooks teach it this way. Because when enterprise value was created by Bloomberg, um, Bloomberg did this in the early 80s, they basically used the definitions at the time. All the academics agreed with Wall Street, and Bloomberg wanted to have a, a default calculation that all the banks would use. And you have to remember that the genesis of everything that you're learning at Smith today in finance comes from Chicago in the 1970s. Right? That was ground zero for modern corporate finance. And all of the PhDs that Chicago turned out then went to other schools. So when I was sitting on your side of the fence as a Wharton student back in the late 80s, basically my professor was a PhD who had come from Chicago. The textbook we used, Brilliant and Myers, came out of the work from Chicago. Brilliant Myers is like the 10th or 12th edition today. Ross and Westerfield was another text we used. And then I forgot the other one, but basically all the genesis were the Chicago PhDs partnering with other institutions, going to other institutions, writing the initial textbooks. Then Bloomberg, all the banks, said, well, let's create common formulas. And these were the academic texts that were proving out all these enterprise DCF models. They calculated enterprise value based on a standard definition. This is Bloomberg's definition that is held true to today, which is it's debt plus equity, common and preferred, minus all cash, right? That is the Wall Street standardized definition of enterprise value. I'm going to call that Bloomberg Enterprise Value, BEV, right? Net debt, debt minus cash, all cash, minus equity, common and preferred. Or sorry, plus common and preferred. So debt plus net debt plus equity. That's the defi definition. That's what you probably learned in previous classes. So let's go back to lecture note two or three. Well, what I'm saying is I want to understand the difference with this is when we talked about actually lecture note three and readings of the book. In the book, we present a more formalized definition of Medigliani Miller. All right. So what I want you to do is when you see differences in definitions, it's not that it's right or wrong. It's just people made a shortcut or people made a simplification or people did it a different way. So let's apply our definition 
and see where the differences are. So if you look at our definition, our definition of enterprise value is debt and equity. So that part we agree with. It's debt and equity added together equals enterprise value. Bloomberg says subtract all cash, right? Now, in our definition, we have some cash as operating cash and some cash as excess cash. So there's one of the differences. But again, here's the simplification. What a lot of finance people will say is it's net debt because you can immediately take the cash and pay off all the debt and then shareholders get what's left. And I'm telling you, in a practical setting, there is zero chance that that could actually happen in the real world because there is no judge in a bankruptcy court or a lawyer that would let the company squander every dollar of cash to pay off the banks in a bankruptcy hearing. Because for example, employees, if you're paid every two weeks, you're paid in arrears, which means it's the last two weeks you work, then you're paid. The employees are gonna have some of that cash set aside to pay for them. If there are taxes owed, there's gonna be money set aside to pay the taxes before the debt holders can get it when that company gets near bankruptcy. The lawyers will actually set aside money to pay themselves and the judge will okay this as part of the bankruptcy hearing. I'm telling you, there is no company that could go down to zero in cash. It just can't happen. And so the, the point is, that's why net debt makes sense conceptually, but in the real world, you can't do net debt. And that's why McKinsey introduced the concept of operating cash, right? Because operating cash just says, look, there's some cash, you gotta just pay employees. You can't give it out to debt holders. There's some cash you gotta pay to vendors. You can't give it out to shareholders. Some cash you just can't pay out. It's actually tied up in the business. Now, in our model, we've just arbitrarily said 2%. 2% of sales is one week of cash, All right? So if you really think about it, we're just saying there's at least one week of cash that you can't pay out. Realistically, for most companies, it's probably a higher number of that. When they get below you know, 15 days of cash, some companies 30 days of cash, they're probably nearing the verge of bankruptcy. And again, if this were the real world, I would ask their CFO. Because you ask a CFO or treasurer how much cash you need to run the business, they know. They have a feel for their business and what they pay. So the best way to do it in the real world is to, is to ask the company themselves. All right? Now, since we're not doing that, and in the simplified version of this class, for purposes of this valuation, we're gonna leave it at 2%. Now, if, if you've done extra work as your group and you wanna change it to a higher number, you're welcome to do it. But I'll also tell you, don't put it at zero. Like, you can't have zero operating cash. You, it's gonna be a positive number. But that being said, so there's one of the divergences, is in the Bloomberg Enterprise Value, they don't separate out operating and excess cash. They just say minus all cash. We're separating out the two. But that's not the real important distinction I wanna make here. The important distinction comes back to here. Where is cash on our Medigliani Miller? One, two, three, four model. Is it a one or two? Where's most of the cash going to probably be? Excess or operating? It's probably going to be excess, actually, right? Which is a two. Okay, so let's think about what Bloomberg Enterprise Value is. It's debt plus equity minus what we would call primarily excess cash. Minus two. Two is a non-operating asset. What are you then left with? operating. <clears throat> Long way of introducing that what Bloomberg calls enterprise value, this is the standardized definition on Wall Street, is much more closely linked to what Medigliani Miller would call operating value. Okay, so the enterprise value you see in the street that you learn in other academic classes is closer to an operating value definition. Now here's the thing, it's not exactly operating value because there are other non-operating assets and liabilities, but again the 1980s, late 70s, 80s, when these formulas were first defined, were a simpler time. Like, we just didn't have the type of stuff we have in 2017 on balance sheets that we did with much simplified, particularly U.S.-based companies, because a lot of this was originally based on U.S. GAAP, based in the early 1980s. And so what I want to tell you is the idea of having a bunch of IP, the idea of having all these joint ventures, particularly cross-border joint ventures, that just didn't really exist that often. So if you looked at the big non-operating asset back then, it was just the cash sitting on the balance sheet for most companies. So again, when they standardized and simplified the formulas, I can see how in retrospect, that's the way that they would simplify it because that got you to essentially an operating value of the underlying value of the business. So fortunately our model doesn't do it this way. But here's the thing. We are gonna to add to our model in the DCF tab 
next to our enterprise value, we're going to call it BEV. And this is the Bloomberg equivalent enterprise value. Right? So we have in our DCF tab our way of calculating enterprise value. And then we're going to have Bloomberg's way of calculating enterprise value within our model. Okay, so we could actually have an apple and apple if we wanted to compare outside of our model. Because if we use the enterprise value for Coke here with the enterprise value we see in Bloomberg, it wouldn't be the same number because we are doing some adjustments that Bloomberg is not. So let's look at the adjusted Bloomberg valuation. So what does Bloomberg say? Well, our definition is debt and equity is enterprise value. So it would be enterprise value minus all cash. So minus from the balance sheet. Two thousand sixteen operating cash minus two thousand sixteen excess cash. So G four and five off of our standardized balance sheet for two thousand sixteen. So that would be the net debt plus equity equivalent in our model. Right? That we're creating in our model. So where we would say the enterprise value of Coke is closer to two hundred and thirty one billion. Bloomberg would have said it was closer to 208 billion, following a similar format of standardization. Questions about what I just did? All right? Here's why I wanted you to do this. Okay? So go to Coke's RV competitors. And then go to the custom template that we did for the multiples. So these were the multiples <coughs> that we've been using for our companies, right? When we do the multiple analysis. So what I want you to do is output this to Excel. So output Excel the multiples template, okay? As opposed to just doing a screenshot of this, which most of you probably again have already done this for your group project because you did the estimated margins, if you're especially going to do the estimated margins for the valuation. So here is the multiples template. Okay, so what I want you to do, save it somewhere on your hard drive, thumb drive, wherever, so you can get access to this file in just a second. So I'll put it in my downloads folder, and I'm going to call this the KO multiples. Okay, and I'm going to change the name instead of calling it worksheet. I'm going to call it multiples. Okay, so then I want you to now I'm on a dual version. Two I have two versions of uh, Excel. I have a Windows version and a Mac version. You'll probably have one on your computer. But then open up both files in Excel. So file. We got the KO multiples. Okay, so these are the multiples that I just exported. And what I want you to do is, assuming you have in the same Excel the valuation model for Coke that we've just been building, I want you to take the multiples. I want you to spell multiples right. Save. Right click on the tab. Mover copy. I want you to switch it to the valuation model, and I want you to move it to the end. So basically, we'll just take that multiples tab and we'll stick it on the end of our valuation. Okay. Now, if you called it worksheet, you could rename it back in the model later. But nonetheless, this is just the last tab of our model. Okay. Now, I then want you to take what you just moved in and move it down one row. Insert a row. And across the top, this would be the estimated margin. This is what I've been doing. I've been overwriting the market cap with estimated margin equals EV to sales divided by EV to EBIT. All right? Make that a percentage. Copy and paste down. So again, we have our ability to quickly do the multiples analysis for our company right here now all within our one model, but that's not primarily why I did this. 
What I then want you to do for cell A1 is type in est or uh, implied model multiples. These are what I'm going to call the implied multiples. Okay, so in our model we have a forecasted share price. That forecasted share price gives a forecasted enterprise value, which that forecasted enterprise value gives a forecasted Bloomberg enterprise value. So in order to do an apples and apples comparison between the EV to sales that we see in the real world on a database like Bloomberg and the EV to sales churning into our model, we can't do it unless we adjust our enterprise value to match the real world EV. So here's the point. EV to sales, implied model multiples, cell D1, equals from the DCF tab, the new Bloomberg enterprise value and calculation, divided by, since we're using the second forward year, from the income tab, 2018 forecasted sales. So that 6.89, which should be very close to the real trading multiple of Coke, is the EV to sales in our model, and that is the observed EV to sales for Coke today, based on Coke share price. So what I'm saying is we should get numbers reasonably close to this. Right? Because basically, if I'm doing an as-is valuation and I'm relatively close to the current share price, the EV to sales of my model should be very similar to the EV to sales that we see in the real world. Does that make sense? So we're going to do this for four ratios. We're going to do this for EV to sales. We're going to do this for EV to EBITDA. So EV, Bloomberg EV, off the DCF tab, two. Again, the income tab. 2018 EBITDA. We're going to do this for EV to EBIT equals for the DCF tab, Bloomberg Enterprise Value divided by TII, or sorry, um, income, 2018 EBIT. And we're going to do it for our price to earnings ratio equals from the DCF tab, common equity value, which is essentially the price divided by the income tab 2018 net income to, available to common shareholders, which is sell 25. So 2018 I-25. So there's the forecast PE. So the first line is the model EV to sales, EV to EBITDA, EV to EBIT, and PE. Row four is Coke's actual trading data today. All right, and those should be pretty close. With the one exception, as we start, PE is maybe less close. All right, and here's why. Because the PE multiple is based on net income. And if you remember, when we built this model and we were forecasting the income statement, and it was like currency gains and losses, I said just use a zero. One time gains and losses due to accounting adjustments, just use a zero. Don't change the interest expense. All right, just leave it constant. Well, those were probably not 100% realistic assumptions that the real world would make for gap for a company. So the analysts, which are actually forecasting the gap statements, probably would make adjustments that we didn't. Now, they're, they don't really impact the valuation, but they would impact the forward PE. So what I'm telling you is our PE is probably going to be the one least close to the PE if there are adjustments that are made to the company that we didn't make when we did the forward valuations. So, but here's the real point of the story. This is a sanity check. This is gonna help you make sure, which is why we call these applied multiples, that when you do your target price, you're not too far away from reality, okay? Now, here's the thing. If we come up with a hold for a company, right? Basically, what we're saying is we think the company's stock price should be similar to what its current stock price is. You don't really have to worry about a sanity check because it's already trading at that price. So there's no justification to say it's going to trade at that price because it's already trading at that price. So you don't really need sanity checks or holds. It's really when you get into the buy-sell category that you got to be careful that you don't start believing your own BS. All right? And it's like you just get in this assumption mode where it's have assumption after assumption after assumption, and then suddenly you're into something that's not realistic. 
And so here's where I want to give you an example of this. Let's say I'm doing my model. So I'll save this. And I come over here to the ratios. And I convince myself that Coke is just going to go into bullish growth mode again starting in 2019. And they're going to start growing revenue at 15% a year going forward. All right? Whatever rationale I come up with, this is my belief. Okay? And I convince myself that they can actually start growing at 15% after shrinking. They'll go back to where they were and they'll grow after that. Okay? So that gets me to a share price of $70 a share. And they're obviously going to be a strong. Look at a $70 share price and look at these multiples that they would have to trade at to generate a $70 share price and tell me if they, you think they're realistic. Look at the entire industry. Just remember, multiples are expected growth and spread. Looking at the entire industry, is anybody trading at 10.84 times sales? Startups? Even the smaller companies trading at 10.84 times sales. Is anybody in the industry trading at 28 times EBITDA? Is anybody in the industry trading at 31 times EBIT? Does anybody have a PE approaching 40? Maybe. This craft brewery, tiny company, easy to have high sales growth. Is this a share price Coke is actually going to achieve in the next 12 months? No. Even if I were to do a bull valuation, I'm doing the bull, the optimistic scenario. Can I put this in my bull scenario? If you do, bullshit is what you've just done. All right? And so I'm just telling you, it's so easy to say plus or minus 30%. There's my bull and there's my bear. How did I do it? I just made up a range. This is what I mean by no value to that. Because if you look at the top end of the bull valuation and you look at the range of multiples that that would create, I can't think of a scenario that's going to get Coke there in the next 12 months realistically. All right, outside of a huge acquisition, and this, and we're not talking acquisitions here, we're just talking in organic growth. All right, so <clears throat> basically, this is how we check ourselves. All right, so if you think about what we did at the beginning of the class and previously, we used the multiples to help back into some assumptions. Now what I'm saying is go the other way. Use your assumptions to create multiples. Triangulate. Okay? We're always triangulating. And that's the point, is that if we start living in an assumption world, it's really easy to come up with share prices that look reasonable at first glance, but when you really think them through, they're probably not so reasonable. So how do you know what's reasonable, what's not? Use the multiples as a sanity check. See not just what your company's multiples are, see what the industries are, because you've got a whole range of expected growth and returns for all different types of companies. And I'm not saying that Coke can't change, but what I'm saying is, is there anybody in this industry that has that type of growth return? And the answer is no. So unless the market has just completely got this wrong, which I doubt, then I don't think Coke is going to move into this range anytime in the very near future. Because again, we're talking about the next 12 months and we're doing a target share price today. So this is the sanity check. So here's the deal. In your final group presentations, final projects, right? You're, you're going to do evaluation as part of your evaluation. If you have anything but a hold, you would have to do the sanity check. And you have to say, here's our final share price. And oh, by the way, here are the implied multiples of our final share price. And here's why we think the implied multiples are achievable by our company. All right, so it's not whether they're there today, it's just that they're potentially realistic and why you think that they're realistic. So that way, when you say buy or when you say sell, it makes sense to me that this is a, a range the company could actually trade at. So they would end up trading, this price would be this times EV to sales and EBIT and EBITDA. And therefore, if we look at the industry, like they're not there now, but they could probably get there because some of these other companies are there. That seems reasonable to me. As opposed to showing me something like this, and then I'm just sitting there going, how did you come up with that share price? Where did those assumptions come from? Like, there's no basis in the real world for that. So this is the way to ground yourself. Questions? So today we've covered two things. Number one, we've covered how to estimate a G for the multiples. And number two, we've covered how to do an implied multiple sanity check and add to our model a Bloomberg equivalent value 
enterprise value so that we can actually do the sanity check. And this basically completes your model. So use these features as part of your group project. Questions? Yes? Can you just go back to the DCF valuation tab? Sure. Again, you don't have to be exact because, number one, you should be close to these because depending on what share price you used, right, and at the time you did the actual data entry, it, Coke stock price has been bouncing around. So you, if you're, a, you know, relatively close to this, it should be fine. But, you know, if you had a share price of 45, well, then you wouldn't probably have the right data. Oh, okay. these are the, these are, these are, this is your bubble case. Right? No, this is, well, the bull case was that, yeah, this is just the crazy case to illustrate the point. If I undo this, so let me go back to the ratios. Where I, I said is, and, and again, you could have a slightly different number because you could have said, you know, a couple percent and then negative two percent or something like that. But it appears to me that somewhere around one percent is what is closer to the current stock price, which is even less aggressive than what a few of the analysts are predicting for the next couple of years, the way that they're trading today. Okay, so just because an analyst puts a number out there doesn't mean that the buy side has to follow what the analysts say. And what I'm saying is I think the analysts right now are probably being a little bit more aggressive on what they think Coke can do than the actual share price is illustrating. That's a very important nugget we get out of these as-is valuations. All right, other questions? Yes. How you get the multiple from Bloomberg? You're talking about the Bloomberg enterprise value? How you export from Excel? So in your model here, yeah. Output Excel. That's all you got to do. All right. Last thing. This is an extra credit exercise. So if you were able to do what I just did, if you go, you'll see an extra credit listed in the assignments tab. Upload this file by 5 p.m. today, and you get two points towards your semester grade, which is enough to replace a broken or missed homework assignment. Or if you did all your homework assignments, it gives two extra points to your total semester grade on top of that. So either way, this is an extra credit assignment. But it's only available if you complete it by five today. So I know that there will be more crowded classes later today. Right? So it's in your interest. I think that there's a benefit to showing up. <clears throat> so by showing up, I'm sorry? I just recorded this as a video. Okay. But it's more important that you get to this point, plus or minus a little bit, and upload it and take advantage of the fact that you were here and you get extra credit. And don't just tell everybody to come to the later classes that otherwise wouldn't come, because like I said, I, I think there's a benefit <coughs> to people that actually show up. And not that they're not getting credit for the rest of the semester. Everybody's yeah. got the assignments. But this is an in-class extra credit assignment that I'm getting. So make sure you upload it before, because the link goes away today right after 5. So make sure you upload it. And I just finished recording this on video. I will post it on YouTube, but I'm not going to post it before the end of the day because I don't want people that didn't show up in class to be able to do it and get the extra credit. Right? So they'll get it and they'll be able to do it, but they're just not going to get the extra credit for doing it. So I'm not going to post a YouTube video until 5 o'clock today. All right? So if you have any other questions, see me before you leave. Please try and make sure you take advantage of the uploading before you leave. And otherwise, we will have a live class on Wednesday. Teams, uh, the last two teams, just so you know, you will have an assignment given on Wednesday for Monday. Okay, so the last two teams are going to have their final team assignments for next Monday. They'll be giving out on Wednesday. All right, so we'll talk about that during Wednesday's class.